Stories are everywhere. They shape up our day-to-day -day lives. We can tell them to ourselves or to other people. But as my mom says, thoughts materialize. Our inner stories show themselves physically. I have recently come to realize the value of stories in my own life. I spent 10 months in Russia, my family's country, which allowed me to explore its history and its role in my life. Living in England, at times, I felt disconnected from both countries. As Charles Dickens said, it is the most miserable thing to feel ashamed of home. So as a way of reconnecting to my Russian side, I've hopped back the generations of my family, looked at their stories, who they were as people, and how their qualities have been passed down the generations. I've traced it back all the way to my great-great-grandmother. When I was younger, I used to hang out with her in her room. She loved sunflower seeds. She would sit there in her flowery armchair and peel the crust off of each individual seed for us to eat. By the end, she'd have a whole bowl full. She loved going on walks, wearing her super cool sunglasses and, oh, and sun hat. <laughs> Um, to exercise her brain, she would solve crossword puzzles up until 103 years old, and she would leave the pen neatly on the side when she was finished. She grounded and still grounds our family. Those of us not living in Russia would fly in to celebrate her birthdays. Toasts are a part of every meal in Russia. My grandpa would stand up, and still does, to say his abstract, long-winded toasts, I used to get very nervous before saying a toast, but I would never let that stop me from saying one. A toast is a way to reconnect with everything a family stands for. So, as a so to say my toast, I would stand up, hit my glass with my fork to get everyone's attention, and as I stand up, the toast that I've been rehearsing in my head the whole of dinner would disappear. Suddenly, there was so much to say, and I would say it in my rickety Russian, because looking down the table, I realized every individual at the family makes the family what it is. My great-great-grandmother said a toast one birthday. She didn't stand up, but she looked down the table and said, every, um, you're all very dear to me. Not everyone's here, but at least every generation is present. I wish you all to live in friendship. A 75-year-long Harvard study tracked the lives of 724 men to see the trajectories that were in common to all of the lives. Every two years, they would ask them questions about their home lives, their families, and their work. When the study began, some of the men were sophomores at Harvard University, and the other half were from some of the most disadvantaged and troubled families in Boston. Most of the volunteers went off to serve in the, in the war. Some became doctors, lawyers. Some went off to work in the factories. But one became president of the United States. The experiment concluded that the men with the most happy and healthy lives were the ones with the best relationships. Your, the number of close connections doesn't matter, but the quality of your close relationships does. A good relationship prolongs lives and improves memory. It makes physical pain less painful. A good relationship doesn't mean that it's smooth, but as long as it's trusting, it can withstand anything. Paul Zak, a neuroeconomist, researches how stories move us. Stories are immersive when they're emotional. We're not as logical as we might like to believe. For example, when a character is down, we feel sad. When a, char when a character achieves a feat, we feel empowered. People with injuries of the part of the brain that controls emotions are unable to make decisions. Consumers are not drawn by low prices or by the colorful packaging, but by their emotions. For example, a man called Rob Walker bought 200 items off of eBay for $128. He then asked 200 writers to write a story about each item. He then sold the items along with their stories for $8,000. For example, he bought this horse's head for uh, 99 cents and sold it for $62.92. People bought into the stories. Zach says that stories draw on our deep social nature. Chimpanzees, for example, walk around in groups of 20 to 50 chimps. These groups are designed to survive. The human equivalent to such a group is 150 people. 
This is because we also know how to gossip about each other. In other words, we know and tell stories about one another. We're all tied together by the stories we tell. Our brain gets value out of such interaction, value in the form of oxytocin or the cuddle hormone, which is also released during sex, childbirth, and breastfeeding. Humans have evolved to exceed the magic number of 150 to form cities and towns. This is because of the appearance of fiction. Large numbers of strangers can cooperate successfully with one another by believing in common myths, common stories. So to tell stories, we must communicate well. When I first moved to England, a country both antithetical culturally and linguistically to Russia, I didn't know much English. A girl at school thought that I was dumb, as in I didn't have a tongue, because I was a bit of a mute for a few months. During an art lesson, my art teacher told me to put my glue stick away in the wooden cabinet. But I was so confused. I had not understood what she had said. I just sat there in my chair. I also didn't know how to write my name on my drawing because I didn't know what it was, what it was in English. I was also awfully proud of my 27% that I got in my first English test. So during these first few months, my communication with others was very minimal. Quality communication builds quality stories. But we don't just communicate with ourselves. We also more frequently communicate. Uh, we don't just communicate with others. We also more frequently communicate with ourselves. The stories we tell ourselves form our reality. A show on Netflix tested pleasure and pain. One room was set up to look like a lab. People in white lab coats, wearing scary, wearing scary lab coats, wearing scary equipment, were, <laughs> were uh, told the volunteers that the laser beam will shine on their arm and induce pain. But the volunteers weren't told that the laser beam actually did nothing. After some stressing, the people realized that after their brain relaxed, that the laser beam actually did nothing, and they admitted that they felt no pain. However, after the room was set up to look like a spa, the laser beam again shone on their arm, but this time it was said that it would induce pleasure, not pain. Again, the laser beam did nothing. But this time the humans said that the laser beam was so pleasurable that it drove them to, an extent, to the extent of near euphoria. So our brains tricks reality. We, societally, our negative neurons have been strengthened more, but humans are drawn more to positivity, not negativity, pleasure, not pain. Happiness and positivity are deliberate rewirings of the brain. You live out the life you believe in. So I would like to finish with a toast. As one Russian song says, hard times are easier when we believe in happiness. When you're happy, share it with others. Thank you.